Okay, we look at uh, BBC News here today, and we find there's a English say one third DNA is actually Anglo-Saxon, and they find a burial here that's uh, in uh, east of northern England area, and it has a burial. Uh, that was an area that, uh, if you'll look, wasn't too far below the ground. It was an area that was inundated and would become like a bog, and a, a bog or a marsh swamp area, I think. If this is the same one that they have the other story about, then it's an area that uh, somebody was metal detecting in and saw some detection and went down, bored through, saw some bones, and then oh, called in the police and the archaeological stuff. And uh, I don't know if you can make it out here in the burial. You see this reddish area, kind of orangey red area in here, around here, down here a little, around the baby quite a bit, or the youngster that's there. And uh, blue right in here, blue up here. There's blue spots all around here. Some on the lady all around cascaded and stuff. Well, this appears that uh, what this is is... Uh, where copper has just eroded away and I don't know if you know but copper like on your battery terminals and all this stuff will actually erode and turn into this bluish green blue copper sulfate types thing and uh, so it just erodes away and rots real bad brass lasts a whole lot longer but yet it still does the same type effect because it's made out of again copper and such uh, and there's a ring right here that's been made also and uh, he has, I don't know if you can make it out in the picture here, but he has this little necklace here that's made of puka shells. And I wish I knew more about it, but these are from the Mediterranean, so they are from somewhat a distance away, uh, which is kind of neat. And uh, when the guy found them, of course, he thought, you know, somebody buried somebody in a shallow grave. Then as they dug them up, realized that it was a family. So that's probably this one. Um, I'm, you know, I, I just guess that it's going to be this one. Um, but kind of neat, and it shows a youngster, a family perhaps, all dying at the same time. And a lot of these other burials, they'll be headless and uh, are decapitated and the heads put back with them. And that goes back to old Cro-Magnon and Canaanite burials and things like that that they've found. Well, let's look at this information here. And you see the lady's legs are crossed over the man's. The man's are there normal. He's kind of reaching out to clutch the baby. So this looks like it was all interred at the same time they find out his hands in kind of a strange position over his heart and uh, things so kind of neat uh, this triple burial at Oakington Cambridgeshire includes metal and smaller amber grave goods and uh, I don't know what and there's amber too but uh, there is a little ring thing right here around the child's neck looks like that he had some stuff on too I don't know perhaps they've already taken a few of the things away I'd like to see all the goods out of that that's always sometimes one of the neater things especially when you look at some of these anglo-saxon burials where they had the uh you know burial mounds and things which are real famous now uh the present day english owe about one third of their ancestry to anglo-saxons according to the new study scientists sequence genomes from 10 skeletons unearthed in the eastern england and dating from the iron age through to the anglo-saxon period many of the anglo-saxon samples appeared closer to modern dutch and danish people than the iron age britons did and uh, this kind of makes sense whenever you know that there are an endemic people and then there are some people that are extremely close related but they had gone all the way through the Middle East and to other areas and then whenever you have them come back and uh, that they might have other admix and changes and indeed just time and I, I, you know I believe this totally you'd have to really keep studying it but it seems like it's easy to see in gen genetics that uh, over time you end up are going to have uh, splicing off and changes because people are naturally still evolving and so you'll find strains and strings that are no longer evident or they're locked down into sequence farther and you know that that means that they're uh, you know uh, more of a primordial sequence and something that had happened before rather than after and it keeps going with this idea and this zipper effect but I digress um, the whole results will appear in nature's communications journal and uh, we could look at that but that would be boring as hell for you probably me too according to the historical accounts and archaeology the Anglo-Saxons migrated into Britain from continental Europe and from the 5th century AD that's what we believe but 
They brought with them a new culture, social structure, and language. Genetics have tackled the question of Anglo-Saxon ancestry before, but sometimes it gave conflicting results. And I'll tell you now that the conflicting results were that um, if you say old burials from here, old burials from there, which one do they match? They seem to match these Middle Eastern people and people in Sumeria and the skull structures from there and things, and that's just weird. Of course, those people, and even on the farther side, which we were talking about in the Sakasuni here just recently, have this effect and this blue-eyed thing going on and a lot of factors that let you know that they were the same people. In fact, the Persians, when they attacked them, uh, said that they were uh, all the way up into that area, all the way past Rome into that area up there that they were trying to attack them through. So where did they come from and when did it happen and did it happen in more than one way? I think we've kind of proved that it happened in more than one way. Just like the Vikings. You think about a Viking kind of thing and everybody thinks, well, oh, one Thursday, here's what happened. And it's like, no, no, that happened over a six, seven hundred year period. And I believe we know now it happened over 12, 1400 years and from a lot before that even. And who were these people before? And whoa, you know, so no, it's not quite the same as it was. But again, I digress like I always do. But yeah, it gave conflicting results and results they don't want to share. It's one of those things where um, it's funny, you'll find papers nowadays and for people to protect their own job due to modern PC culture and everything else, they'll actually just tell you they have conflicting results. They'll come out with their paper and try to hint at things and stuff and then they'll tell you, well, it had conflicting results. And they kind of, they're trying to let you know, ah, ah, ah. but of course, at the same time, the people that are really not wanting it to come out are like, okay, you know, you know, you know at least you said that, you know, versus, you know, because I'm going to condemn you if you get out of our little trail path. If you try to even bounce past our number 50 years, we're going to freak out and just, just bury you. But anyhow. Confounding factors include the close genetic affinities of people in northwestern Europe and the scarcity of ancient DNA from indigenous Britons and the Germanic-speaking migrants. Uh, like a variation on a theme there. But it takes something like that to show you the slight variation of it. Uh, there's not anything to where you can tell, oh, okay, if you had two of them buried next to each other, you can go, here's this, here's that. It's not like that really at all. It actually takes till a modern geneticist. That's the reason if I was to tell you that certain people went into certain areas and things and a lot of people just think I'm just hokey crap and maybe I hadn't studied anything before or know what the hell I'm talking about or how in depth I may have gone you know or in anything along those lines and sure some of these cultures I didn't go that deep into none of it was my field of study but I think you've seen I know a hell of a lot about a lot of them and I can put it together like a pretty good web. Um, just like you look at these things right here. And uh, these guys are wearing horn helmets and stuff. And they got the horn hats like the Sumerians do. And then here's a picture of a lion. And it's got that same Sumerian type thing in the guy. And uh, wow, so no, uh, no connection, nothing. Nothing. Hitting. Well, they had lions all the way up through there. How many of these got a snake coming down his forehead like an Egyptian? You see that? No, nothing. Nothing really showing up. Couldn't be anything. Okay. Anyhow, let's just go on. Dr. Stephen Schiffels of the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Germany sequenced genomes of human remains from Hixton, Saffron, Walden, Linton, Oakington, all of which are near Cambridge. So this is like little villas all the way around it, you know. The burials fall into three different age categories, Iron Age people, Early Anglo-Saxon, and Middle Anglo-Saxon. And so what they're expecting you to see is one people, and then an admixed people, a little, and then later a more admixed people. But it came out kind of weird, and it still shows a little weird. It says, contrary to narratives suggesting large-scale displacement of the Britons by Anglo-Saxon invaders, the researchers found evidence of intermarriage in the earliest phase of settlement. Not giant wars and crappy things. 
in order to disentangle the Anglo-Saxon signal from the indigenous British genetic background, the research looked at many rare mutations across the whole genome. So I think they glean information off stuff like this. They, they look at uh, certain genome things and they're like, okay, these people have it and these people don't. Who ends up having it later? Stuff like that, right? So in order to look at this farther, they say we found that these rare mutations were the key to studying historical samples. Um, we could compare our ancient samples with modern samples in an improved way. Uh, Dr. Schiffels told BBC News, we could, we could look at these in a very large sample of modern Europeans. For example, we studied low frequency mutations that must have occurred in the ancestors of the Dutch over the last few thousand years, things that cropped up into them. We found that these mutations were shared with the Anglo-Saxon immigrants at a factor of two more than they are with the indigenous Celtic people. These are mutations found only with the whole genome sequencing. So I'm guessing that what they're saying there is that they're finding, okay, there's well, the way people look before and the way people look now, and they see a lot of the similar traits coming out of these two groups of people that happened from this one before. It's kind of a long, drawn-out, lawyeristic way of saying it somehow, but th that's it. Like, uh, regardless of how much admix, we are seeing this here and that there, like a convergence. Convergence is something in biology that where like there's a vine snake in Africa and there's a vine snake in South America and it really takes somebody who knows what the hell they're doing to look at them and tell you which one's which but they're not even related in any way shape or form but they did co-make something that is extremely similar to each other and they serve the same purpose both of these vines and giant elephant ear type plants over there have new leaves that come out as that spring they hang out there because birds come and land right there towards the edges all the time and snack, they grab them. Same exact thing, different creatures. So they call it convergence. You know, it's, it's uh, whenever two things evolve or turn into the same thing or develop it or even people. If you have people that convergence is the pyramids and the pyramid theory where uh, over in South America, they make pyramids that are stepped up and look a whole lot like the early step pyramids and the early um, ones that are in Sumeria and the Mastabas, and they even really look a whole lot like the ones in Iraq now that you see that are the real ziggurats and stuff that's really that style and more leaned in and sectioned, and you see the same type building over here. Well, given a bunch of different ways they could have done things, they end up doing them that way. And so that shows you a convergence that was supposedly not really touched upon, but have the same similar traits. I don't know if that explains it in any way the way that I'm thinking that they're even looking at it, but I hope that explains it a little bit. So this picture right here is the remains of uh, Driffield Terrace in York, and it might be uh, those of Roman gladiators. So this also, now, now they're going to try to twist it one way, and uh, I'm just going to be the uh, ass and twist it the other way and tell you that uh, so that might mean that some of these Romans and these Roman gladiators aren't necessarily Roman gladiators. Right? Well, we know the Christians and all. Well, hold on, hold on. From there, the scientists could track the contribution made by those Anglo-Saxon migrants to modern British populations. They found that on average 25 to 40 percent of the ancestry of modern Britons is attributable to Anglo-Saxons from the Sakasuni and Isaac sons we were talking about. But the fraction of Saxon ancestry is greater in Eastern, Eng Eastern England, closest to where the migrants seem to settle, or where they dissettled more. You know, uh, uh, let's just look at it as being America. Whenever people all came to America, you can tell that there's definitely more of a I don't know, you'd say more of a Jewish population up north, though not so much anymore, but there was areas that were a whole lot more one ethnicity than the other. Uh, due to their liking of the cold as much, saying Spaniards were down a little bit more south and so on, and um, you know Mexicans to this day and so on, but not so much. They're living in New York. There's Puerto Ricans up there, you know, and everything. But in general, what you would say it was more like that, and now they're seeing it to where it seems like in that area too, it stayed stronger. 
where the genetics over here seem to be a lot more mixed and dispersed out and of course we're starting to look at Denmark and all these places around and that diaspora and the influx that could be happening but anyhow um, even traditionally Celtic populations such as the Welsh and Scottish so some Anglo-Saxon like ancestry I'm trying to mess that up ain't I even though it's typically lower than that in Eastern England but Dr. Schiffels points out that it is difficult to tell when this genetic component arrived there until DNA from Iron Age remains in those regions is analyzed. And I believe some already has been. And I believe that it didn't show very much difference either. I mean, I could be wrong about this. Maybe if 7P7 watches this one or one, or one of the other guys that I have that knows genetics could tell me. But I believe they've already compared the two. And it's kind of like what they did in Egypt where in Egypt they tested the oldest graveyard and they saw that they had people coming all the way down to till about Roman times and they wanted to see the difference from all the times they had gotten invaded and that way they'd see these slight differences and glean a whole bunch of information and after they did the whole thing they said well it kind of disappointingly it didn't change very much you know it didn't hardly at all and then down here kind of a little and then the Negroid Ag mix shows up much later in stuff than we ever thought it ever did it's kind of strange and also those genomes and things kind of show to be more of a European people showing you that all these people that were in the Levant and all these other areas kind of had that blonde haired blue eyed thing back just like it shows you in all our art but we don't talk about that as you do can't mis proto Indo Europeans right so in another study they also published in Nature Communications Professor Dan Bradley from Trinity College in Dublin and college and colleagues analyzed the genomes of nine individuals from Roman area York not Roman area Roman era York so things from about that same time here coming around the turn of the century up to three or four hundred AD they found that six of the individuals, presumably indigenous Britons, were similarly to the modern Welsh, but were different from populations living in Yorkshire today. However, one of the individuals had genetic affinities with people from North Africa and the Middle East, providing evidence of long-scale migration in Roman times, even. The burials at Driffle Terror, well, that kind of alludes to what I said a minute ago, and but didn't they already have other burials that were up there that they whenever they genetically test them they said that oh it's and it's a uh, people from Africa and people all the way from uh, ancient Persia that it doesn't match the Persians of today but the ancient Persian burials it's just like that alluding to the same idea in fact I'll track it down because it's one of my attaching threads that shows you the people I was just showing in my last couple of vids and how they could be up into this area and the whole Darius thing and all of that anyhow um, the majority were male. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the barrels at Driffield Terrace from which the genetic data was drawn fit the profile of Roman gladiators. That's kind of important to show that because the genetic thing says that all those people look like people you've living in Wells and like Yorkshire in elder times, but not necessarily the Yorkshire today. Those people have come out to the suburbs but just just slight genetic differences too they're getting so damn good at this they can kinda of tell you all they do is gotta find somebody else that's got that and then they run it through a machine and they've got a database and pa-ting and I can't tell you this why I'll lose my job oh come on you know I'll lose my job what kinda of... <sighs> right the majority were male under 45 years old and had been decapitated they were also slightly taller than the average for Roman in Britain times which most showing signs of trauma to their bones somewhat but they weren't they weren't mangled in any way and stuff these people were buried and stuff however professor Bradley like you saw in the one uh, however Professor Bradley and his colleagues point out that the remains might also be compatible with Roman legionnaires so he's gonna throw that in there as a little sidekick but uh, I'm telling you that if it was Roman legionnaires and back at this time that would rewrite history as to far as whenever the Romans first started coming over with the legionnaires wouldn't it wouldn't it predate things at least 400 years I think something around there three and a half 
But uh, so that wouldn't seem to be so right if you date the earliest ones they have from here, and that's when people are buried. Uh, are we led to believe that these? Oh, the first one, they ran over there and died. There they are, the first ones. It's funny when I look at things like this and I see these archaeologists. They seem to have this idea when they find one that that's the earliest. Every time, I used to go into this with some of them. Every time they find something, they they say it's earlier, okay. But when they say earlier, they say ist. And I I've corrected a few. I'm like, oh, that's the earliest one we know about, but that's probably not the first one that showed up there. And they go, well, it's the first one we know about. And I go, well, um. But it's, it's not like they ran there and then died, poof, and there they are. And who the hell buried them? I've seen guys get real red in their cheeks after you say that. Well, but yeah, and I go, yeah, so they must have been there for a little while. Let's just give them, you know, you can give them 100 to 200 years. You can give them at least a few generations, can't you? I mean, you don't see any fresh horse tracks around here or anything. I mean, what's going on? At this time, people didn't build civilizations that were lasting. That this is a huge forested area. They built things out of wood. That crap's gone. Right? Anyhow, guys, I'll, I'll uh, forward on to a, a few other ones and stuff. I don't know if you've seen the other ones that I made out of there, but I, I've shown some of these, like Sutton Who and a few others that they've found. And it's amazing what could be in these mounds. And again, I think that attaches it to what we've been talking about lately. These Kurgan burial mounds, these Isaac burial mounds these Isaac and Isaac's sons they talk about the Sakasuni and Sax sons and how that these people are saying that's who that is in the Bible they talk about the sons of Isaac and what he pertains to and I think a lot of geologists are not by biblicals have tracked this down to be yeah it's a diaspora that run up through there they have a biblical model of where everybody runs and this is pretty much accurate for it too where the tribe of Dan comes up to the Danube River and Danites and Scandinavia and the Danes and all that type of stuff and what that would pertain to and the people of God and Og and uh, where that where that comes up to and uh, you know so anyhow interesting story here just thought I'd share it with you and it's gonna be not gonna be a real long one we'll go on this is just a filler material something they found and then I wanted to vamp over it from what even they're saying now they're trying to wedge it that way and I'm like no dude it's already there I mean it's you it's like you've got to wean people onto an idea that we used to have back before the dark ages and in fact up until very recently I don't understand what and then now they got a kid gloves you with reality it's it's kind of just yeah like, share, and subscribe. Enjoy.